Our speaker this morning is Nimala Sivakumar. Nimala is a three-year boarding student from Cranberry, New Jersey. She is a co-chair of the Student DEI Leadership Council, a member of the Ellis Theater Guild, and a Thursday Writing Fellow. She is also the proud roommate of Manaya Person Henderson. Nimala? This one's dedicated to a little girl who didn't think she'd make it. When I was six-ish, my first grade class and I went to Jenkinson's Aquarium. It was a day-long affair, and it had taken me weeks of pestering to get my parents to sign the permission slip. But alas, I was there with two small pigtails in my favorite dress and a brown paper bag lunch. The one thing I did not have money for was the gift shop. I had also asked my parents for money, but they told me I would spend it on something I didn't need. So the trip was mostly joy and happiness through looking at the Nemos and the Dories. At the end, I was the only kid waiting outside with two parent chaperones whilst the rest of my friends paraded around the gift shop. I sat on a bench, swinging my legs and waiting for what felt like forever till they came out led by my teachers. Some kids had stuffed animals like little fish or octopi. Some kids had Jenkinson's aquarium magnets, but a few kids that I knew well came back with an extra brown paper bag. When I asked one what they had gotten, they told me hermit crabs were being sold at the aquarium gift shop. So at a very young age, I became superficially obsessed with hermit crabs. We'll get back to the hermit crabs later. There were many reasons I was excited to go on that trip that day, including my first grade obsession with dolphins, which I believed I would see at an aquarium, as well as my love of the beach at the time, one I do not share with my current self. But the one that sticks out to me the most is the fact that growing up, I didn't really have a home. School felt like home in a way. At six years old, I had spent my life in a few different places. I was sent away as a baby to India to live with my grandparents for a few years, then came back at Forish to the States to live in North Brunswick. Not long after, I moved to my current place of residence in Cranberry, New Jersey. So in a very real way, at that age, I didn't know what a constant physical home was. When people asked, I knew what to answer with, my dress. But it didn't bring me what I thought it was supposed to bring me. A child of Disney and Nickelodeon specials, every character that I saw had a home of some sort, a guardian or two who had managed to pull together for the main kid and even another kid they weren't related to and helped and supported the kids when they needed it. In my house, I followed a strict routine. I was clean because it was expected of me. I did extracurriculars such as tennis and dance since my father picked up tennis when he moved to the States and my mother did dance when she was younger and in a sense lived vicariously through me. I did extra math outside of school to stay on top of my class and I did extra English outside of school to catch up what years I had lost in English development. I felt so out of place in my home. It wasn't the stuff of Disney specials. I didn't have much freedom. I can count on my hands the amount of times I hung out with other people in my school. It didn't feel like what I expected a home to feel like. It felt like a place where I was simply an expectation, a possible bragging right, a disappointment at best. From six and onwards, I felt a little empty always. I thought that was how I was wired to be. Something was missing in my home, sure, but I thought I deserved it. I had complicated feelings about the way I was living. I struggled a lot with the idea of deserving the treatment that I got when I was younger. And I thought I deserved feeling like a disappointment because I wasn't doing enough. I thought I deserved feeling depressed because I wasn't a good enough kid. When my brother was born, he became the golden child. A child genius in some ways who still plays tennis, golf, basketball, and swims and learns extra math and English outside of school. I wondered why I wasn't like this kid. I wasn't mad at my mom who held resentment against me for not wanting to dance or my dad who was upset with me since I made it very clear that tennis was not a passion of mine or my sister who was always pitted against me in competition or my brother who was everything my parents had ever wanted in a child. I was mad at myself. I was mad at myself, but I also wanted to be selfish. I wanted to know where my home was. I wanted to know where I could take off my shoes and cry without shame. I wanted to know where I could try and fail and not be looked down upon for it. 
I wanted to know where I could feel comfort and consistency like I had seen on TV. It felt like I didn't have a home. So I resorted to what became so popular when I was growing up, a do-it-yourself DIY. I would make my own home by finding the place in which I was most comfortable, whether that was physical or metaphorical. In classic unhealthy fashion, I extrapolated the only constant I had in a very inconsistent life. I became comfortable in my self-hatred and my depression and saw it as a home in many ways. When I started recovery, I struggled with losing the one constant in my life, my self-hatred. It was venomously com comforting, this one presence that, no matter how evil, always managed to show up when I needed it the most. I came to Hill and went to counseling, and one of the questions I, I remember quite clearly was whether or not I actually wanted recovery and why I was clinging on to a state of mental disarray when I could actively try to be a little better. I had to detach myself from my DIY home after confronting my unhealthy relationship with my mental health. I opened myself up to happiness, made friends, joined new organizations, and decorated my dorm room. Here was this new feeling, this mellow sense of sincerity and serenity that I allowed myself to feel attached with those people, that place, and that advisory, and I wanted to make it my new home. They felt so familiar, so loving and true. But I remember that day in the spring when it felt like it all came crashing down. Mr. Benzanon, my advisor at the time, quieted our advisory and said he had something serious to discuss. He was leaving. My sixth form friends were suddenly talking about graduation. Suddenly I felt jilted, like I had to create myself a little home out of this new mess. I spent the last weeks of my fourth form year crying my eyes out, mourning how nothing would ever be the same again. Those moments passed, but I remembered the sadness. I felt it again the following year when I attempted to hold people like water in my hands as they left. My fifth form year, my advisor left again, my sixth form friends left again, and the world shifted a little bit. Once again, I lamented the loss of friends and adults that I had counted on in the toughest of times. Nothing would ever be the same again. To a girl experiencing symbolic comfort as presented in TV and film for the first time, moments like that felt empty, like a vacuum of time that had just lost all meaning. I felt like I had lost my home again. But now, I can say maybe I was the fool for expecting things to stay the same. Stay the same. I won't resort to the true but overused cliche that value is found in the temporary nature of time, but rather to the idea that none of us have any constants in our life. Actually, that's not true. We all have one. Wherever you are, though millions of minuscule things are changing as I speak, there is one constant in your life, yourself. So back to the hermit crabs, if you haven't forgotten about them already. I will add a disclaimer now to say that I was superficially obsessed with those hermit crabs. With the gift of hindsight and the gift of writing, I can pin symbolism onto it and say, hey, look, what a smart six-year-old I was. But truly, I just wanted something I didn't have. I bring up the hermit crabs more so to introduce the great wisdom we can deduce from these creatures. Everywhere these little buddies go, they take their home with them. No matter how far they are from where they're born, they can close their eyes and tuck themselves under a shell and find themselves at home again. I didn't know this at six. Frankly, I didn't know it at 17. I found this little piece of wisdom while attempting to write this chapel talk. When we relinquish our power to choose when we feel comfortable to some catch-all word like home that is sometimes limited to a place or a group of people, we lose that comfort as soon as we can't access that place or group of people. As the sixth formers stare out into the horizon, we see graduation coming up. 40 days from now, if I'm right. A plethora of possibilities are, are before us, but more importantly, a larger number of unknowns. When will we see each other again? When will we see third formers who have become like little siblings, our favorite teachers, the fifth formers we've hectored about the college process again? There's a lot we don't know. There's a lot that changes with every word I speak. The tree's leaves fall as sure as the sun will rise, and over and over again, we watch the world change with every moment we spend awake. And so, the true constant in our lives is ourselves. 
hang up some lights in your brain. Maybe purchase a mental ottoman to rest on when you're thinking a little too hard. Get a coffee machine, because there's no residential life rules in your brain that getting a mental coffee machine breaks. Because at the end of the day, you are all you have got. I'm all I've got. So I can say now that no matter where I am, in the quadrivium, in Cranberry, in upper school, in the CFTA, in the dining hall, in the library, I am home. Awake, asleep, anxious, depressed, happy, uncertain, fearful, fearless, exhausted, ecstatic, awake, asleep, I am home, I am home, I am home, I am home, and so are you. Thank you.